want to welcome you to this, our service of worship. And it's been a busy week this week with uh, uh, the community prayer outreach in the pop-up shop. And we'll say a little bit more about that uh, later. It was really profitable. And we do want to give thanks for, for God's blessing in that event. And the writer of Hebrews urges us in Hebrews 13, verse 15, to come through Christ and continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And so may we give thanks with both our lips, but also with our lives as well. Let us glorify his name this morning as we sing of our opening hymn, which reminds us of all that God has accomplished through his Son. He is the one who is the risen, the conquering Son. Nine be the glory. And we'll stand as we sing this together, please. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we can come to you through Jesus, your Son, the one who is risen and is alive forevermore. We want to give thanks for his continual ministry, even in glory, and we give thanks for how he continues to make intercession for us, even at your right hand. We thank you that because he is risen, we have a living hope. And we have one, a, a, a risen Savior who continues to save people. We, uh, Father, we know that because he has risen, Lord, that all those who have that same faith in him will be able to enter into glory and to, to go where he has gone into your presence. Lord, we want to thank you for that. Lord, that we have a living hope that we have a glorious hope. And Lord, we want to thank you even for the week that has gone before, 
for this community prayer project and we give thanks for the fellowship that we have enjoyed there with our brothers and sisters in the Methodist and uh, Presbyterian Church. We pray for all those who came into the shop over uh, that week, for those who were spoken to, for those who were prayed with. And Father, we ask that we continue to work in their lives. We give thanks even that so many received of these hope magazines. And that as they read them, Lord, that your word would accomplish that purpose for which it's been sent. Lord, we pray that what has begun here, Lord, will continue to, to flourish and to grow. And that it would be the means of reaching others in Cumber. Lord, we do pray for even those in the, the net who, who had organized this. For, for, for Bert, James and Steph as they reach out to the young people uh, in the area. Oh, Lord, encourage them even uh, by the response to this event. Lord, we pray for ourselves also as we gather here today to worship your name and to give praise to you. Lord, focus our minds upon you. Lord, stir our affections for your word and for you this morning. And Lord, we ask that you would help us as we lift our hearts towards you in praise. Help us in our service today as we meet together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me mention a few announcements just as we begin. So next week is our harvest service, and that's going to be taken by Keith McElwain, and he's the associate pastor from Hamilton Road Baptist. Uh, so we'll be collecting items uh, for the food bank, so the church will be open on uh, Saturday morning for these uh, to be received. Uh, we do want to thank you uh, for also for your prayers for the community prayer project. It was good to work with some of the other churches uh, in our area, and I know that during the week uh, a number of people came in to that uh, pop-up shop and were uh, spoke, uh, had a shared conversation on a cuppa, and also were prayed with as well too. So even the time of fellowship that you had with uh, the other churches was really encouraging and as, as well, and I know they were encouraged by it too, and a number of uh, those magazines, the Hope magazines that we had here, were taken as well. But... Uh, just pray that those who took them, you know, the Lord would continue even to speak through that. On a Tuesday night, uh, God willing, uh, Alfie's going to share uh, a little bit just about what happened during the community prayer project. So maybe after the message, we'll get Alfie up to, to, to talk about that so we can pray in response to what went on during that week. So come along on Tuesday night to hear all about the community prayer project. And also want to thank you for continuing to pray for the kids club. Uh, the first week it started, we had a small group of just uh, eight children. But on Thursday night, that number nearly doubled as we got to 15. So it was really encouraging there. And uh, the, the children who were out were all at our, at our holiday Bible clubs before. So it was great to see them again and to see them so enthusiastically coming along as well. Prayers are being answered, and we've also had an additional helper to help us with the teaching uh, as well, too. There's a, a girl from Dundonald Baptist who's been working with us in that as well. So prayers are being answered. So please do be encouraged by that, and keep praying for the work of Kids Club, and pray also even for just further outreach that we do in the area. As you know, we'll have the, the college team also coming. Uh, now that the Community Prayer Project's finished, our, our focus is now going on to the, the college team coming at the end of October. And they're coming in the week beginning the 24th of October. So we're awaiting details of the team, how many's coming and who's coming as well. So we haven't found that out yet, and we'll be waiting for that. But there will be lots of ways in which you can help. We'll be giving out some publicity near the time about the different events that we're going to run. We're going to need some help even with you to invite people along to those. Also, there's other ways you can help too. Maybe if you could provide, maybe say even a lunch for the team one day, maybe making them sandwiches or even some soup or, or maybe you could um, even bring them something for, for dinner. Even it could be at the church or even um, at your home if you'd like as well too. Uh, so they will be taking them around, obviously, various places in, in Cumber as well. Maybe be dropping them a few of the cafes as well. But if you are able to help in any way, uh, even with some of those arrangements, please just let me know. Uh, that would be a great help and encouragement. Plus, it's a really good opportunity for you to get to know some of the team when they come along as well. 
But do pray for this. There is a lot of things to be organized for this. Uh, these next couple of weeks are going to be really, really busy uh, with that. So would appreciate your prayers for that, just that the different things would also fall into place. So thank you for your prayers for all these different things, but keep praying as well too. Well, these are all announcements, but we began this morning by giving praise to God for Jesus, the risen, conquering Son. And now we're going to tell of God's greatness, his power, and his glory as we sing, Tell Out My Soul. And just stay seated as we sing this. Please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're going to read the first uh, 13 verses of this chapter. And so far in our series in Acts, we had talked about how the disciples prepared for the mission which Jesus had commissioned them to do. And that mission, of course, was to make disciples by taking the gospel throughout the world. We saw how they had waited in Jerusalem in obedience to as Jesus had told them to do. They were to wait there for the Spirit to come upon them. But we see, and we looked last week about how that waiting, it wasn't passive waiting. uh, Because they met together, they prayed together, and they also sought God's will together. uh, Even in how they should replace even Judas who had left their number. And they sought God's will in that, and we talked about that last week. They replaced him with Matthias. But they continued to wait on the Lord. They wait on the Lord, they depend on the Lord, they prayed to the Lord until they receive that power from God on high. And now today we're going to see the fulfillment of that very promise that they had waited for. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered. Because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and all parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, 
We hear of them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. And we'll end our reading there on verse 13. This was the coming of the Holy Spirit, the moment that not just they had waited for some days, but that people had been waiting for for years to come. God had promised this long before. And so we're going to sing another hymn together now. And it is a prayer that God's Spirit would move in our lives as well. It's breathe on me breath of God. Let's stand if you're able to as we we sing this hymn together. Well, before we turn to God's word, we're going to remember some of the different needs of our assembly. Um, We've got some uh, prayer requests as well, so some things to remember in your own private prayers. You'll have seen, if you are on the the text line, some of these already coming through. But just a reminder, pray for the the grandson of uh, Jackie's friends. Little baby Joshua is going through major surgery. So pray that God would strengthen him for that surgery. That's the grandson of Jackie's friends. So uh, you'll see little updates coming through about Joshua. Um, They're just asking that we would pray that he would be strengthened for that surgery because operating on a a child so young uh, is a very serious matter. And pray for his family uh, as well too. Also pray for Carol MacDonald, who's a lung infection at the moment. She's asked for prayer for her uh, sister Heather is in hospital. Uh, So ask that we'd remember her uh, as well too. And you'll have seen also on the prayer line requests some uh, good news as well coming through there regarding Bill and Aris's grandson, Aaron. He's now come off the ventilator and able to breathe on his own. And I give thanks to God for that. We've been praying for Aaron for this last little while and just continue to pray for him and his recovery and pray for the family as well, even just to give them strength as they continue to go up to the hospital and visit him as well. And we can also give thanks for good news regarding Terry and Nancy's grandson, Theo, who has been in hospital for several months and he actually got out uh, there as well. So just give thanks to God for that. So a number of things we can give thanks to God, but a number of things we can also continue to pray for. So let's do that now as we come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you for answered prayer. How you answered the prayer of the believers in the early church and how you kept your promise towards them. And Lord, we know and we are assured that you hear and answer our prayers too. Lord, we've seen evidence of that even already 
this week, just in recent days. We give thanks that little Theo is, is now out of hospital after all this time. And we pray for him and his parents as they care for him. We give you thanks, Lord, for answered prayer even regarding Aaron. That he's now off this ventilator and that he's breathing on his own. Lord, we ask that you would continue to heal his body. We do pray for the, the doctors and nurses as they continue to, to treat him and make decisions regarding his care. And Lord, we pray you'll continue to, to strengthen the family as they, as they visit him regularly as well, Lord. We know even how even exhausting and that, that must be, Lord, even as well, as they've been so worried over this last uh, number of, of weeks as well, Lord. Just And we give thanks, Lord, for how you have sustained and, and kept Bill in our us, Lord, and for this news of encouragement. Father, just maybe continue to pray for Aaron, even in his recovery. And Lord, we do pray for, uh, for Carol. We pray, Lord, that you would heal her from this lung infection that she has. And we pray for her sister, Heather, in hospital. Lord, strengthen her and help her. And we pray for Joshua, baby Joshua, Lord, we ask that as he is having this major surgery that he's going through for one so young, Lord, how it is incredibly serious, Lord, we just pray for the surgeon who will perform that procedure. Lord, grant him wisdom, or grant him or her wisdom as they operate on Joshua. Lord, we want to give thanks for the skill which you have given surgeons. We give thanks as they operate, Lord, that, that you would guide their hands in the decisions that they make. Lord, grant them wisdom. Lord, we pray for those who will nurse Joshua as well, those nurses who look after him. Lord, just grant them that help and wisdom even they need and his continued care. Lord, we pray for the family just going through unimaginable worry at this moment. Lord, draw near to them. Grant them the peace and strength even which they so need. And Lord, help them as they await even further news. Lord, we want to give you thanks, Lord, that you do care for us, that we can cast our care upon you. And Lord, you know even of private, unspoken burdens even here today that people have. Lord, you know their hearts as they sit before you. And so, Father, just minister to them today. Even may the something that's said through your word or even in the singing in these hymns be an encouragement and be a help to them as well. Lord, we ask that you would move in our spirit today, our, our church today. Lord, may your spirit, as it works within ours as well too, strengthen us, help us, even embolden us and equip us for witnessing as well. Lord, help us and be with us today. Speak through your word to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's turn once more to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. The scene that takes place here had been, it had been some 10 days before Jesus had ascended from their midst. And this group of believers, some 120 in number, had gathered together in prayer. And this prayer was not passive waiting. They were continuing to seek the Lord. They were depending on the Lord. And we're talking about the, the importance of that in previous weeks, of the importance of depending on the Lord. Because without him, we can do nothing. And, you know, we know it had, it had been 10 days that they spent in prayer because uh, it was 10 days since Jesus had been um, arrested, crucified, and, 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 and uh, then we know that when he arose, he appeared to his disciples on ten, uh, of multiple sorry, occasions over 40 days. Uh, so the events we read about after Jesus had ascended, uh, when you work out the miles of the, the 40 days of resurrection uh, appearances, and uh, we, we read also about then the 10 days that they spent in prayer, now is the day of Pentecost, which was some 50 days from the time of Passover, which was the time when Jesus was, was crucified. So when you do the, the miles, about uh, 50 minus 40 and so on, it was 10 days that this group really had been together praying. 10 days of seeking the Lord, earnest seeking. In verse 1, we're told here, they were gathered together in, in one place. There was this great sense of unity, and they were of one accord, we read all the, uh, in uh, chapter 1. 
and great importance of being of one accord, united in purpose, united in serving the Lord, united in this desire to see God being glorified through them. And there was a, a whole group of people gathered here, as I say. It wasn't just the disciples, who were now 12 in number, uh, but there was, there was also, it says, the women who followed Jesus and supported the disciples. There were a number of uh, women amongst the early church who, who did support the disciples in their, um, their ministry, as well as the family of Jesus Rose also gathered here. So some 120 in number, as chapter 1 reminds us. And these events take place at Pentecost. And that was significant in itself. Uh, Pentecost, as I said, was 50 days after Passover. And the, in fact, the word Pentecost actually means 50, really. And it was, it was known as the, also as the Feast of Weeks. It was a, it was a harvest feast. So it was, a, it was a time whenever the first crops were gathered in. So as the first fruits or the first crops of harvest were, were gathered, they were offered up to God in, in thanksgiving. It was a time as as the also uh, at the time of writing here, it was the time when uh, it was also uh, traditionally in the Jewish calendar marked as the, the anniversary of the giving of law, the law at Sinai, because uh, it was reckoned that this happened some 50 days after the Exodus, which was, of course, took place the, the very first Passover, in effect, when the angel had passed over uh, the houses of, of the, the children of Israel. You know, in many ways, this day of thanksgiving, a day of harvest, was very timely because on this day, there was going to be a harvest of another kind. There was going to be a harvest of souls that was going to be wrought at Pentecost as well. A day when many were going to be pointed to Christ. So it's a very significant, a very timely event. But also, it's timely and significant for another reason, because at the time of Pentecost and, and during the annual feasts, uh, Jews would make their way to Jerusalem from all different places. The Jews, a number of the Jews had been scattered through all different parts, but whenever uh, the annual feasts came, they would have made their way to Jerusalem. So they're all gathered and, and packed in together in Jerusalem. And again, that's significant. The timing of this, this is no accident. The timing of this is all in God's will and God's plan. You know how God does move in mysterious ways. He moves in ways even that we don't comprehend. And yet, God chose this very moment to send his spirit amongst the, his people in a powerful way. Notice how the spirit came upon them. And I've just really three headings. The, the first one, and very simply, is the spirit comes. In verses 1 to 3, the spirit comes. And as the believers met together, likely for prayer, a number of amazing things happened. Now, notice how the spirit came upon them. The first thing was the sound that they heard, a powerful sound from heaven, like a mighty rushing wind. Some translations render this like the, the noise of a violent wind came upon them. It came in power because the whole uh, uh, house where they were gathered was, was filled with this sound. It was a, this was no natural occurrence. It doesn't say that it felt like this wind was blowing through, but there was the noise of it was filling the whole house and again the symbolism of this should not be lost on us uh, the fact that the spirit was going to come with wind and with fire the wind actually speaks often of of both the revelation of god and the work of the spirit in fact actually in the old testament uh, the the hebrew word ruach which means wind can also be translated as spirit as well in Ezekiel 37, uh, verse 9, the prophet is shown, you remember that vision that Ezekiel was given of a valley of dry bones. And he asked Ezekiel, can, the, can these bones live again? And God, through his power, sent his spirit, this, this wind blowing through that valley. And he breathes new life into these bones. He makes them alive again. And so, in many ways, the same thing was happening really within these believers. God's spirit was going to be breathed out upon them and new life was going to be given to them as well. New life to equip them for the task which they were going to be sent. And then there was this other sign appears too, not this time not a, an audible one, but a visual one. They, they saw fire, fire which divided up into uh, tongues of fire 
it says, which rested even upon their, their heads. And fire in the Bible uh, speaks of often of the presence of God. Again, the imagery of this is very significant. Remember how uh, God spoke to Moses through the fire of the, of the burning bush? That's how he spoke to him. Remember how he guided his people with a, um, a pillar of fire? Again, speaking of the presence of God. There was a fire even at, the, uh, at Sinai when the law was given, indicating that God was present with his servant Moses. There are many examples of this here. And, and as this fire comes to rest upon the, the heads of these disciples, and I have to say it wasn't an all-consuming fire, as we see, it was resting just above their, their heads, showing that God's Spirit was resting upon them. You know, there's these two symbols of wind and fire also remind us something as well too. In Luke 3, verse 16, John the Baptist had said to those who were gathered, you know, he, uh, I, he said that John the Baptist, he baptized with water, but there will be one greater than he, speaking of Jesus, who will baptize with the, the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that fire was coming to rest upon their heads. This, this image that John had spoken of was now being fulfilled right in their sight. A sign that the Spirit was coming to rest upon each of them individually. You know, this was a miraculous event. An event that not only Jesus had promised some ten days before, but also one that had been spoken long before that, some hundreds of years before where the prophets like Isaiah and Joel had said that God would one day pour out his spirit upon men. And Peter's going to talk about that um, in his sermon, God willing, next week, or the, the following week when we look at that. God, it's not that God's spirit wasn't working before this event. It's not that God's spirit was somehow absent before this event. God's spirit still moved in, in different ways because we know that the spirit it was even there in the very creation. The spirit, it says, moved over the waters of the moved over the deep. We also see the activity of the spirit in the, the Old Testament when God through his spirit would often empower people for some form of service. So for example, God's spirit came upon a man called Othniel, who was a judge in Judges three ten. God's spirit came upon him to enable him to judge the people. The spirit of the Lord in Judges six comes upon Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon David as well to equip him for the task. But here's the thing. In the Old Testament, these filling, this filling of the Spirit, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a permanent indwelling of the Spirit for all believers in the Old Testament. But God prophesied of a day when his Spirit would be poured out upon all believers. And it would be a permanent indwelling. They would come to know God's Spirit in a, in a way that, that people hadn't before. This was an event which would transform the church. It was an event that would empower the church, and it did so in such a miraculous way. You see, there, was, there wasn't just this noise of the, this mighty rushing wind. There wasn't just this sight of these tongues of fire. But there was also, you could see the effect. You know, we can see the effect of uh, even the, the, the wind around us. As we, as we walk, we look and we can see the wind blowing the, the trees as well. And what we see is when God's Spirit came to indwell with these believers, there was people could see that there was a change in their life. Let's look at the next heading in verse 4, the effect on the disciples. Look at the effect on the disciples. Verse 4 says they were filled by the Spirit. He'd entered into their hearts in a, a powerful way and he transformed them in an amazing way. And this expression, being filled with the Spirit, is often used in, in two senses in Scripture. It can be used to speak of a, an initial filling and, and we know, um, uh, as I mentioned, I think, last week from verse 38 of chapter 2, uh, whenever someone repents of their sin and believes in Jesus, they automatically receive the Holy Spirit. From this point on, that's what will happen. Whenever people trust in Christ, the Spirit comes and indwells within them too. So we are filled with the Spirit. But then if this is the case, why then does other writers like Paul talk about you know, to the need to be, to be filled to the Spirit? Is Paul talking about an additional filling? Why does he talk about this? You know, that might be, seem a little bit confusing because when we think of something being filled, we maybe think of the image like a, like a glass 
uh, when you try and, and fill a glass, if you uh, fill that glass, you know, you don't normally fill that up again unless someone drinks out of that glass or, or maybe you spill a bit out of that glass. But that's not really a helpful way to think about what Paul is, talks about later in the filling of the Spirit. He's not meaning that somehow we are leaking the Spirit in our lives. That's not what Paul is saying at all. Theologian Wayne Grudem likens it to the, the filling of a, of a balloon. When we blow up a balloon, we blow up air into it. When we blow up that balloon, we can hold that balloon. We can uh, put a few puffs of air in that and say, there you go. That balloon is filled with air. And that's right, isn't it? But you can often keep on blowing up a balloon, blow another bit into it as well, and it continues to be filled. And it's more really that sense, whenever you read about this filling of the Spirit in, in Paul's letters that's talking about here, it's like a, uh, an additional uh, 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 filling, like a, you know, in a sense that the Spirit's controlling us, that we would need the Spirit's empowering. It's not that we haven't the Spirit. It's not that we are somehow leaking the Spirit But whenever we're seeking to serve the Lord, we should have that desire that God would fill us in the sense that we would be controlled. That spirit would control our words. The spirit would control our actions as well. That's the sense that we are talking about here. When we are filled with the spirit, that as we are seeking to witness for the Lord, we need to be filled with the spirit in the sense that we are controlled by the spirit that we would know of the Spirit's empowering. We have the Holy Spirit already in our lives, but that we would know the Spirit's help and empowering when we go forth. See, that's what these disciples needed. They could not do that in their own strength. That's why Jesus had said to them, wait, wait, you, you cannot, they cannot, could not go out and, and witness in their own strength. You're gonna see the effect of the Spirit in a moment in their lives. You're going to see the effect of that, even God willing, as we looked at the next part of chapter 2, as Peter speaks. This was God working through him. As the Spirit filled the disciples, there was an effect in their life. It says that they began to speak in other tongues. Now, this passage has caused much debate about what the nature of these tongues were, but for me, the passage is very clear as to what the nature of these tongues were. These weren't some Uh, an unknown language to the other people that they began to speak. But actually the Holy Spirit enabled them to speak in the languages of of the others who were gathered around. They were speaking in in languages that could be known. Um, There was many people gathered around Jerusalem at that time, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the Greek word here actually for uh, tongues here is a word that can also be translated as languages. They were able to speak, and it was, a, it was they were speaking in other languages that they didn't personally know. They were able to speak in the tongues of the, uh, the Medes and uh, the Elamites. These were people who wouldn't have known these before, yet God's Spirit enabled them to do this. And we know this because the text makes it very clear, because it was as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit gave them that utterance to speak in that other language. You know, by this stage, it seems the disciples had left that room where they were gathered, and it was likely something of a a hall, really, where they were gathered initially. Well, it had to have been for 120 of them, but it was possibly a hall near the temple. Why do I say that? Because when Peter begins to share and begins to explain what has happened, we know there were some thousands of souls saved. Where would have had the typical gathering that number? Would have been the temple. So maybe they came from that room where they were gathered and went into the temple courts. And as they were speaking, the crowd, it seems, began to gather around them. You know, we know later on from from chapter 2, there were several thousands who witnessed what would take place. Because many people were saved as a result of that message that would later be proclaimed. But the church, you see, needed the Spirit in order to witness. You know, the Spirit enables us too. He may not enable us to speak in some foreign language. I don't think you're going to all of a sudden go down this street and speak Ukrainian or Japanese today. But the Spirit does enable us in other ways. He gives us boldness to speak. He gives us wisdom to answer. 
He gives us enabling power to, to glorify his name. I wonder if you had experiences like that. You know, where you've been sharing with someone and you've, you've prayed that prayer, Lord, help me. How do you answer here? And all of a sudden, the Lord has just brought that verse that maybe speaks into that situation. Or sometimes you've, you've been talking with that per, uh, person and maybe you've been a bit hesitant about how to witness. And all of a sudden, the Lord has given you that boldness to be able to speak out. How we need that filling, in other words, that controlling, the Spirit controlling us in those moments. That God would give us the words. That God would give us the wisdom. The wisdom in when to speak. But also the wisdom in when to listen. That's important too. That's important too. Because that helps us in our witness too. We, we need to have that boldness to speak. The wisdom to answer. The wisdom of when to listen. And the wisdom to speak. And the enabling power to glorify his name. You see, there was an effect of the Spirit. And whenever God's Spirit comes to dwell within our hearts, when it comes to dwell within the, hearts of a, the heart of a believer, well, there should be a change, shouldn't there? Maybe a believer, maybe if there was that person, maybe say if they're, if they're only just saved, if that person, maybe they wouldn't have given the time of day to in the street, that they see them in a different way. Once God's Spirit has come to dwell within them, they... They have the love, the joy, the peace. These things should be beginning to be evident as the Spirit grows within their heart. God's Spirit, as he enters in, will, will change that person's life. But I want you to look at the last thing here, the response of the people in verses 5 to 13. <clears throat> verses 5 to 13. We're reminded that at the time of the Pentecost celebration, there were many Jews staying in Jerusalem. Now, during the annual feasts, as I say, Jews um, such as these would have traveled from different lands to come to Jerusalem because they all wanted to make their way to te the temple. There were devout men, it says, from every nation under heaven. And when it says devout, it doesn't mean that they were saved, but it means rather that they were uh, religious and God-fearing men. They didn't know Jesus, many of these people who, who had gathered, but you know, they were people who had feared God. They, they came to the temple. I know Peter is going to, how do we know we, that many of those who had gathered at the temple weren't saved? Well, Peter is going to be standing there preaching a message of repentance, urging them to be saved, convicting them even of their sin. And, you know, as people heard the commotion, they began to gather. You know how it is if you've ever been, say, in a very busy town. Once you see a crowd, everyone begins to wonder, Oh, what's that? What's that crowd all about? And and soon a crowd draws a crowd, and people began to hear the you know the excitement. And I'm sure as these disciples came down, there was there was excitement on their faces. They were speaking as well in these other languages. That too, people would have went, "What's going on over there?" And they would have made their way over. And again, this was proving to be an opportunity because as the people gathered, they were going to have a tremendous opportunity of a crowd to preach the gospel to. And here we see, you know, they were joyful because they'd received this ancient promise that had been promised long before. The, the, the Spirit had come upon them. And, and as this crowd gathered together, they spoke these languages. But then the, the people who were gathered together began to recognize it. Someone maybe who was a, a Parthian said, hold on, did he just say, hold on, that's, that's my language. Or maybe there was a Mesopotamian person from there and they stood there saying, hold on, that one over there speaking my language. And they were listening, they were attentive to what was going on. They, but it says they were amazed and astonished. Verse 7 tells us another further reason why they were astonished. Because these said to themselves, aren't all these people speaking Galileans? See, it was surprising to them because Galilean, the, Galilee had a bit of a reputation and it wasn't a good reputation. The Galileans were, were country folk. They were rural people. And people used to look down a bit in the Galileans. They thought of them as being ignorant people. They thought of them as being not, not well educated. So they thought to themselves, how can, can these people be, be speaking our language? Did they not come from Galilee? Don't think Galilee has a university near it. How, how can they be speaking these languages? How, how is that happening? You know, maybe they recognized they were Galileans for, from their accent, or, or maybe there was some in the crowd who said, who recognized these people themselves. But they thought, how can these 
uneducated people be speaking our language. And, and verse 9 to 11 records for us the details of, of some of those who were gathered around. There was Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia. And that's only naming a few of them. And when you look up these uh, lands and these peoples that are mentioned, you'll see the list moves from the east to the west, then from the north to the south. The point is that not only also were there Jews gathered there, there was proselytes, and proselytes were Gentiles who had converted to Judaism. Now, why is Luke telling us this? Is he just recording this because Luke is a, a medical man and he likes to keep careful records? No, I think it's more than that. Clearly, it is more than that. The disciples were called to, where were they called to proclaim that message to? Was it Galilee? Was it just Judea? No, they were to go out into all the world. And actually what had happened, in many ways, most of the world was actually coming to them. Most of the world was coming to them. They had actually come to them from all these different places. And as they proclaimed the gospel, think about as people received the gospel then from all these different places. Those witnesses became witnesses. Disciples made disciples. And the gospel actually went forth. When the Jews from these different places went back to their homelands, they took the gospel with them. How the gospel spreads. How this was in the very plan and will of God. See God's planning even in the very timing in which this came. You know, look at uh, verse 11. They heard them telling in their own tongues. And what were they saying? They were telling of the mighty works of God. Because when the Spirit came, they were equipped for a mission. And when they were equipped for a mission, what did they do? They began to go and undertake that task straight away. Once that equipping had happened, they didn't just stay in the room and say, you know, what should we do about this now? What, what do you think? They actually went out and did it. They immediately went and served the Lord. They went and did it. They maybe declared how God had, with the work that God had done in Jesus, how God had not only sent them, but he had raised them from the dead. How he was an I ascended to heaven. They declared the mighty works that God had done in Jesus. And that's what we are to do as believers. To declare of God's mighty works. Not just with our lives. But actually with our lips as well. That's something that's required of all of us. They were to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. And they went and did it. They waited till they received that empowering. But, but here's the thing. The empowering that they were empowered with, we've got that same empowering in our life. The Holy Spirit dwells within us too. We've got the same word. We can tell of God's mighty works as well. We know the word of God. So we are to tell of them. You know, these disciples went forth and Peter was going to stand and proclaim a powerful message to them. But it wasn't so much about what Peter, um, it wasn't the, the fact that Peter was some high persuasive speaker. This was the power of God's spirit working in his life. You know, but what we see and what we're reminded here, there was different responses to the word. In verse 12, there were some who were amazed, perplexed and confused. Because they were wondering, what, was, what did all this mean? What did this strange thing mean? And Peter's going to tell them uh, in verse 14. But while one group was looking for meaning, there was another was mocking. Some mocked, verse 13. They, they said, oh, they're, they're just filled with new wine. Now think about that for a moment. Was, there, was that reasoning possible? No. Have you ever met a drunk man who all of a sudden could speak a foreign language? No, they might somehow speak sometimes unintelligibly, but, you know, to be able to somehow speak a whole brand new language that they didn't know, that's not how it works. That's not what happens. And yet, you know, what they had witnessed was so plain. They could hear people saying, that's my language. That one's speaking my language. Someone else going, that's speaking my language. And despite hearing this, despite seeing this plain, clear work of God, this supernatural work of God, they simply mocked. And how sad that is. Sometimes when you, when you share the gospel with someone or, or when you bring them to maybe an evangelistic event where the gospel is so clearly, plainly, 
and maybe even powerfully shared by someone, maybe given their testimony or something like that, and yet someone just simply mocks. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? When God has worked in such a marvelous way, such a, a powerful way, and made the message so clear and plain, and yet they simply laugh and don't want to know. You know, often when God works, whether it be in a powerful answer to prayer or in a life even transformed by Christ, many who witness it fail to comprehend what's just happened. Instead, they, instead of seeing it as a work of God, they, they do mock. And yet from Jerusalem, the gospel was going to go forth. The effect of the gospel was going to be undeniable. These people may laugh and they may mock, but God's word wasn't going to be hindered. God's work continued and God went out. God is is powerfully present, as one commentator remarks. He is powerfully present here directing his mission. And that's the thing we need to realize God is still present among his people. God is still directing that mission. You know, there were some stories even when we were hearing last night as um, we met to talk about the community prayer project and just even hearing how even maybe someone came in who was maybe even hostile to the gospel, but actually hearing actually how God is even going to work through that. How now we know that's a person that needs prayer. How even others that the Lord had brought them in over the cause of several the course of several days. How God was working in their life, moving, you know, in their life. How God maybe even had brought circumstances in their life to actually bring them to this point. You know, God's work continues. And you know, for the disciples, this event, the coming of the Spirit, was life transforming. Their ministry was changed from this point. And you do see this in the book of Acts because there is this boldness that wasn't there before in the disciples. There is this power even in their, their preaching and in their, in their witness that wasn't there before. The Spirit was an essential ingredient, not just in their ministry, but in their lives. And the Spirit's an essential element in our lives too. We receive the Spirit when we're born again. We, are, we need to be we need to be filled and controlled by that spirit. We need to ask and pray that God would work in our lives, would empower us. Yet the problem is so often in our lives, we so often maybe forget to pray as we ought. So often maybe when you're asked that question or when you try and do something, you try and maybe do it in your own strength without taking that time to say, Lord, Help me here even as I answer. We sometimes try and go it alone and we wonder why we fail. You know, one commentator marked on the importance of the Holy Spirit to our mission as believers. And here's what he said. Without the Holy Spirit, Christian discipleship would be inconceivable, even impossible. Because he says there can be no life without the life giver. No understanding without the spirit of truth. No fellowship without the unity of the Spirit. And no Christ-likeness of character apart from his fruit. And no effective witness without his power. As a body without breath is a corpse, so the church without the Spirit is dead. You know, in our lives, how we need the Spirit to equip us and our witness. How we need in our lives to be living lives that are marked by holiness. There would be nothing to to hinder the Spirit's work in our life. How we need that our mission would be empowered by the Spirit. We are praying, and I've asked you to pray today about the likes of the the college team coming. And we are going to be organizing things, but I don't ask you just to pray about that God would help us just to organize things. Because we need God's Spirit moving. Not just in the lives of those outside the church convicting them of sin, but in our life too. That God would give us the boldness maybe to maybe to go to that person who maybe just hasn't been receptive before. That God would maybe give you the uh, the even words to say as well to maybe that neighbour 
who you've maybe not invited along before or, or maybe has asked you a number of those questions and you're thinking, how am I going to answer that? How we need the Spirit's power to, to move in our lives. But even that the Spirit's power may be evident, that even when people would see in our life that there's something different about them, that they would see we are, the church is living, the church is active, but God's power works in and through us. And so in our lives, let us give our lives fully and completely over to him. Do you know, without him, we can do nothing. We can't do it in our own strength. The disciples couldn't. That's why they didn't leave that upper room until they had received the power from the Spirit. How we need the Spirit's filling, the Spirit's controlling us in our lives. The Spirit lives and dwells within us, but that there'd be nothing that would hinder our relationship with God. That God's Spirit would speak through us, would live through us and be glorified through us. And so may that be our prayer, even in these coming weeks, that God would move powerfully amongst us. Let's pray together. And then after that, we're going to, to sing a hymn before we gather around the Lord's table. Let's, let's pray first before that. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, that you gave your promise of the Spirit. Lord, that the Holy Spirit empowered them to witness gave them boldness to speak. And Father, that the Spirit did amazing things through them. But Father, your Spirit continues to do amazing things, to convict men and women of their sin. Your Spirit even prompts people to, to even enter into a, a pop-up shop and, and chat to people and have the gospel shared with them. Your Spirit continues, Lord, even to, to work even within our hearts even to give us that unity of, of purpose to enable us Lord even to, to speak to display even Christ likeness in our lives and Lord may our lives be directed by the Spirit Lord forgive us if there is those times where we have tried to do it in our own strength but Lord each time help us to depend on you and so Lord we are looking to you for when this team comes. That it wouldn't just be a case of us organizing some things and then praying after, Lord bless it. But Lord saying, be in the, even the very planning, be in the, even the very direction of who is on the team, be in even the shaping of their hearts as they come and the shaping of ours, that we would be a welcoming church, that we would be a witnessing church, a church that's seeking to glorify your name. And so, Lord, may your spirit indeed occupy our hearts, move in our lives, shape and fashion us more into Christ's likeness through your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what I've just prayed, may that be as our prayers, we, we sing this um, great hymn, O great God of highest heaven, the one who occupies our hearts. May he live within us and shape our lives. And let's stand as we sing this together and then we'll meet around the table, please.
Please turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. On Thursday night at the Kids Club, we were looking at the life of Joseph and how God always keeps his promises. And we've seen that this morning when the Spirit came upon his people, just as he promised those years before. But this table and these emblems also remind us of another promise that God kept through sending and the giving of his son, Jesus. So Romans 1, beginning to read verses 1 to 6. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God and power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. You know, this gospel that Paul proclaimed was, it was not a, a new message, but rather the fulfillment of promises given in the Old Testament. That's what Paul is communicating here. This is something which God had promised beforehand. The fulfillment of ancient promises, given even, even in the very Garden of Eden. Jesus would be the one who would have a win a decisive victory over Satan. The fulfillment of the promises made in the, the Psalms. The fulfillment of the prophecies made in Isaiah and Jeremiah and in many other prophets. And here in this passage, Paul reminds us of how Jesus fulfilled some of those very promises. Verse 3, Jesus was born of God just as the Father promised. He descended through the line of David, just as the promise was given to David many years before. The Son of God came in human flesh just as Isaiah had prophesied as well. He was born of a virgin. He gave of his life for our sins, as Isaiah would also speak of in Isaiah 53. It would be by his stripes we are healed. Jesus was born just as the Father promised. Verse 4, Paul reminds us that Jesus rose just as the Father promised as well. David the psalmist spoke of this even in Psalm 16. And this too was fulfilled. It proved he was the the Son of God, as the Scriptures foretold. You know, as he hung upon the cross, there was chief priests, scribes, and elders. They mocked Jesus as he hung upon the cross. Here we see just as we, as what happened even as the disciples spoke. There were some who searched for meaning, but others mocked. And even as Jesus hung upon the cross, the same was true. People mocked again. But yet his resurrection power proved beyond a doubt that he was the Son of God. When God raised him in power, he had victory over death and Satan. He told his disciples after the resurrection, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. But not only was he born as God promised, not only was he raised as God promised, but also he saves God promised in verse 5. Verse 5 remarks, it's through him that we receive grace and apostleship to bring about obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations. Salvation is a gift from God, and so as recipients of this grace, we submit ourselves to him and declare him as Lord of all. You know, in verse 6 to 7 here, we're reminded we are called of God. We belong to Christ. We are beloved of God, called to be saints. We are his, and he is mine. Do you know what a wonderful assurance it is to remember that fact? God keeps his promises. He sent the Spirit. He sent the Son. The Son came, the Son gave of his life, as the the Father had foretold. He rose for our justification, just as God had promised. And he continues to save, just as God promised. And so we continue to serve and to glorify his name 
We continue to testify of the, the mighty works of God. But we look forward to the fulfillment of the rest of the promises, don't we? Because we know in the midst of this troubled world, in the midst of this broken world, that one day all things will be made new. One day, Christ our Savior is coming again. We take up this table till he comes. But we know the Lamb has the victory. The Lamb that was once slain is risen. And praise God is alive forevermore. So as we take of these emblems, let us give thanks for how even they remind us of God's promise was kept in the giving of his Son, in the sending of his Son, in the resurrection of his Son, and one day will be fulfilled fully in the, the coming again of his Son. We're going to give thanks for the emblems shortly, but let me re- remind us of that passage again in Corinthians, reminding us of the significance of what we are about to do and what these emblems represent. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he's betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant on my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, as we gather here together on on a Sunday around this table spread, we give you thanks that you have enabled us to gather together as your people. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for this time we have to remember what you've done for us upon that cruel Roman cross at Calvary. Lord Jesus, a time to remember, lest we forget Gethsemane, lest we forget your agony, lest we forget thy love for us, Lord Jesus, lead us to Calvary. Lord Jesus, as we see these elements sitting on the table, Lord, this bread, this wine, we give you thanks for the bread, the symbol, the token of your broken body. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that you went to this Roman cross, this cruel Roman cross, that we have remission for our sins. So Lord, as we take up this bread, we give you thanks. Amen. Father, we do thank you again for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your promises, which never fail. We thank you, Lord, for the birth and life, the death and the resurrection of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that even now, he sits at your right hand in glory, interceding for us. And just now, Lord, as we would take up this cup, which reminds us of his shed precious blood. Please accept our thanks again in Jesus' name.
Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, for your great faithfulness, for the keeping of your promises, the promises made to Abraham, the promises made to Moses, to, to David, and your promises to us. Father, we do want to give you thanks that these emblems speak of Jesus' coming, of Jesus' sacrifice for us. And Father, they are a continual reminder of that we are here, Lord, dependent on your grace. Father, we are dependent on that grace each day to live our lives as we ought. We are thankful for the gift of the Spirit which you give us to empower us even just to live our daily Christian life. And Lord, help us even in our daily walk with you. As we spend that time around your word, Lord, may our lives even yield to that word. May our will even submit to yours, Lord, acknowledging that you are the great God. And so, Lord, we ask, as we gather in even tonight, as we turn to your word once again, as we spend time in fellowship together, Lord, be glorified in our meeting together. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm.